I just sat there waiting, waiting, waiting. All, all you could do was wait. It was in the early hours of the morning and there was a fog. They told us there was a tidal wave headed our way. There'd been a, an earthquake in Anchorage and the tidal wave was coming down to where we were. We were just a day out of Southampton when the fire happened. All the little boats rushed back into the harbour, but we were too big. I mean, we were a 46,000 tonne liner, right? We heard like the, the fire siren. There were people running about. All the passengers were below deck. They were battening down everything, but I was a deck boy. I had to stay at my station on the deck. Up on the deck, they were dropping the lifeboats. Something happens, you don't have long. You've got maybe one, two minutes to drop a lifeboat. In the end, they sent another boat to tow the ship into Southampton. Did I see it? The tidal wave? No. no. I didn't see it. I heard it. It was frightening, but quite a buzz. I was 15. It was 1962. I was um, 12 years old. <laughs> What was it like being a child in Syria growing up? Mm. Lovely. It was absolutely gorgeous. We had lots of freedom, open spaces. I always wanted to go to sea. Dad was a farm manager for London Bricks. I used to watch him ploughing the field, going up and down, up and down, and I thought, I don't want that. Most of the people had their own fruit trees. So literally, we used to spend most of our time under the fruit trees, getting the fruit of the trees and eating them. <laughs> My dad actually supported me all the way. Yeah, yeah. We went down to London, uh, to Leadenhall Street. I joined P&O. I lived in three different households before I left Sierra Leone. I first lived with my, my godmother. That was from the age of um, 18 months. I was nine months old when mom came here. 18 months when dad came. I signed up to the training school. I was 14. And my birthday was in November, which was good because it meant that I could join a ship straight away because you could join a ship at 15. In Africa or in the West Indies, a lot of parents, um, grandparents look after their relatives' children for different reasons. If they go abroad to study or if they go to work. It's a situation you are actually aware of. So you accept it as the norm. They taught you a multitude of things there. Ropes, all the safety. There must have been a thousand boys there right and a thousand boys passed <laughs> I don't think anyone was allowed to fail <laughs> everything in Sierra Leone was um, British because we were ruled by Britain I started as a deck boy working for as it was then the Orient Line which was part of the P&O company and every day, every morning, I used to scrub the deck with sand soap. And I got paid four pounds a week. My last year there, it was quite a momentous time. That was the year that Sierra Leone became independent. We took the ten pound pumps. You know what they were? Right, well, basically, back in the 60s and 70s, we used to take the British emigrants to Australia and all they had to pay was was £10 and the rest was paid by the Australian government because they wanted uh, immigrants. The Queen and the Duke of York didn't come but the Duke of Kent 
was there. We had to learn a new national anthem because we couldn't sing God Save the Queen anymore. Initially, not a lot changed, but gradually things started to change. Every trip from the UK down to Australia, we had 2,000 passengers and 2,000 crew. When I got to England, well, I miss the weather. Well, we'd leave Southampton, uh, go down to, through the Med, Athens, through the Suez Canal. You'd get a day off at every port, unless you were on watch. And then down to Aden in Yemen. <laughs> That's where you got your bootleg Beatles records. Dad had to bring us coats when he came to get us. It was in the middle of the night. Then on to, uh, well, Singapore or Hong Kong. Down around to Perth, then on to Melbourne and then Sydney. That was the first time I'd seen him in 10 years. Oh. Oh. When we got to Australia, we had four days, right? four days while obviously everything went off the ship, rubbish, everything. All the passengers went ashore and we took on more fuel, food. And then we become more like what's known nowadays as a cruise liner. So by the time we got home, everyone else had gone to bed. Uh, we'd usually go off up round the Fiji Islands or the Marshall Islands, all round the Pacific. All round the Pacific with a ship full of mad, drunk Australian people. My little sister was four and my brother was, I think, um, I think he was seven. I couldn't stand the Australian way of life, to be honest. No, I mean, treating females like absolute rubbish. Ah. I mean, women weren't even allowed in bars. Australian men wouldn't dance. They, they'd just stand there with a big schooner of beer. And it was quite a racist society, yeah. I think we were probably most of us racist to some extent or another, but Australians were pretty bad. I'd seen pictures of them. I, I suppose it would have been different to meet them for the first time if we didn't know that they were there. I went round the world nine times. My new school in London, that was difficult. Out of about a thousand crew, you'd have 300, I'd say, were gay. And they really, they really kept you entertained. They were always throwing parties or, or, or organising concerts or... See, us deck boys, we were only 15, so we couldn't buy a drink. So the gays would go to the bar and buy like a big two gallon bucket of beer and say it was for a party. <laughs> See, even though it was the 60s, there was no judgment. Coming into the school where I started right at the end of the first term of, in the second year. So they obviously the pupils They'd all been together for a year and a term. They were not particularly accommodating or, or friendly. But what was even worse was the fact that I could answer the questions and I could speak English. <laughs> they found that a little threatening. I went to work for Canadian Pacific Freight. <clears throat> and we crossed the Atlantic to Canada up the St. Lawrence Strait up the St. Lawrence Seaway as far as we could, breaking through the ice as we went. That was terrific. But, you know, you spent your whole watch chipping ice off the boat because it, it was too much ice on there. If the boat, boat got too heavy, we, we'd roll. Then, you see, top heavy. We used to joke that we were actually a submarine because there was never more than about four foot of the boat sticking above the sea. <laughs> It came to a point that it, 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 where, where a question was asked, I just couldn't answer. Because I know afterwards 
they would be quite, quite horrid outside of the class. <laughs> you kept doing certificates, learning more skills for on board so your pay could go up a bit. I was, I was a teenager still. When I steered a 50,000 ton liner through the Panama Canal, there was 11 inches uh, of space either side. I remember one time passing over the ship from one side of the canal to the other, the clouds and clouds of purple butterflies. I had violin lessons. The violin was in the store cupboard when I left the classroom. When I opened the case later, my violin was all broken up. I was 22 when I got six weeks leave. Now normally you just left your stuff on the ship and went ashore. Now I was staying at my mum's in Bedford and a petrol attendant filled up my car. Now, you had petrol attendants in miniskirts back in those days. We got talking. Within six weeks, we were married. My mother said since I couldn't look after my things, they wouldn't pay for any more lessons. I had to wait till the ship came back to England to get my stuff back because I, I couldn't see any point going away again, not when we were enjoying ourselves, you know, having a laugh together. Uh, I actually wanted to do law. I thought I could help people. After what happened in school, uh, I didn't feel like, like I wanted to be part of a system I didn't believe in. I got a job driving a furniture van, then, then haulage. Who's handy knowing ropes, you see? Never had to draw the doll, except in the 80s, well. Everyone had to draw the doll in the 80s. I thought, if you could get the children young, if you could start with grassroots, children could become more open to see that there's not so much difference in the races, I decided to go into childcare. My wife did her A-levels, then got a place at Cambridge University doing a degree in social work. She used to come in really tired. But I would, uh, I'd take care of the kids. She was earmarked to be the head of social care at the local authority. But she never got that far. Oh, she died of cancer at the age of 46. I've had three children, five grandchildren. I looked after my mother when she was unwell. My grandson recently acted in a Netflix series with 63 million viewers. I don't remember being scared, no. You just held your position on deck. It, it, it was my job. I couldn't just go wandering off like a tourist when there was a tidal wave coming. I mean, you just knew where you had to be. I actually wrote a, a story about the fire on the MV Memorial when I was at school, about the lifeboats dropping just outside Southampton. Oh. Well, I certainly didn't say a prayer. I gave up on religion a long time ago. Well, the way I see it, if God exists, how could he let my wife die so young? I actually went to my school reunion a few years back. I still love to travel. Wow, oh, it's in the blood. Down to the med. Morocco. There was another girl there from my class. The last two years have been hell. Just looking out the window at my camper van on the drive. The girl, 
I mean, the woman, she、uh, sort of apologized that the girls broke my violin. I think she was a bit embarrassed.、Hmm. <laughs> oh. She said she was really happy to see me. <laughs> 